Hello everybody, this is Michael Hollands once again for Sound of the Movies. Today I have the pleasure to be joined by Rolf Kent. After having graduated in psychology, which he also taught for three years, Rolf Kent decided to concentrate on film scoring. As of 1989, Rolf began working on several TV series and documentaries. Eventually his assignments got bigger and he was hired to score numerous films such as Election, Legally Blonde, Kate and Leopold, 40 Days and 40 Nights, About Schmidt, Sideways, Up in the Air, Labor Day and most recently Stan and Ollie, a film based on the later years of the comedy double act Laurel and Hardy. Welcome Rolf. Hello, thank you. Rolf, at first I would like to know a little more about what sparked your interest in film music and how you became a composer. Well, I was always a composer. I mean, I think at the age of five I was... Uh, first attracted to music, uh, to, well, first attracted to a specific instrument, the double bass. But um, but I'd already been fascinated by sound before then. And at around the age of about 12, I realized that if you're going to write classical music, then like orchestral kind of music, then uh, it has immediate associations for well, for me as a as a, an audience member. Um, if it's in film music, because you, you watch the film and uh, it's at the time it was the only thing you could really own. You couldn't own the film or the, the VHS or the video, but you could own the soundtrack when you were, you know, when you left the cinema. So uh, it just seemed to me that that was great music to be writing, M music that automatically meant something to people. So at the age of about 12, that's when I thought that's, that will be what I want to do. You also studied psychology, which I also mentioned in my introduction, and you taught for several years. Do you feel this is an advantage when it comes to dealing with so many different people, from producers to directors? Do you feel you're able to get into their heads to find out what they really want? Not at all, no. I mean, it's, it's, it's good to have a broad education. I mean, I just think that's you know, a good thing. Uh, I was fascinated, I still am, by people and psychology and... But you know, to be honest, my understanding of people is is about the same as anybody who has an interest. Uh, it's not the 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 university part of it did not really make uh, it wasn't really very uh, practical. So my my you know understanding of psychology is as good as anybody's who has an interest in you know, people's psychology. You had started scoring in the eighties, and you worked on documentaries, TV series. And then you started writing for films. And given your enormous experience today, which knowledge that you have today would you have liked to have had early in your career in order to avoid certain mistakes, music-wise or in terms of communication with filmmakers? Well, I, the, you know, I think I really like the fact that it took me a while to get to film. Film was always the ambition. And I didn't, You know, I, I didn't want to get into television or commercials. I did bits of those, but they were, they were only ever stepping stones towards doing feature films. And it took a while. So along the way, I learned lots of things. And I, I'm, glad I, I'm glad it happened that way. I, you know, I, I know one or two people who suddenly arrived being lauded for, as, as film composers, but they... They just didn't have the experience of years of sort of working their way up there to really know what to do with that. I mean, it, it, it was instantly confusing because you, you just don't have that sort of sense of confidence and, uh, and what, you're really, what your voice really is if it happens too quickly. So I don't, uh, I don't know that there was any particular lesson in those, you know, in, in the path up from the, from from nowhere i don't think there's any lesson i would ever have wanted to miss out on so in terms of is there something i wished i'd known back then not really i, I think i mean there, there's one thing which you learn sooner or later which is it just takes time good ideas just take time you uh, it, it and, and in fact i mean right now i'm starting on a new project and i'm already frustrated that i haven't cracked the main themes but <laughs> But that's, it's absurd because it's so early on in the project. And in fact, you just have to get used to the idea that you're going to be playing around with ideas for several days without 
any knowledge as to whether they're making any sense. And uh, you just have to be in that sandbox for a while, just experimenting. And I, I think that is something you know, that one needs to learn. But, it, but apparently I still need to learn it because I still get frustrated that uh, I haven't nailed my themes already. But it's part of the, you know, I, I, that's an interesting one, isn't it? It's the frustration yes. with, with the, um, the blank page. And um, I mean, there will come a point that, you know, I know what all my themes are, you know, and I, I will sort of, it'll be much more like sort of papering, a, you know, painting a house that already exists. But right now there is no house and I don't know what shape the house is going to take. So there is that sort of uh, frustrating but exciting mystery. Rolf, you're also very experienced writing for, for comedies. What are the biggest challenges for you personally writing for comedy as opposed to drama? Well, I mean, really, I think I treat all comedies as dramas. And I don't really write funny music. Um, the approach has always been to look for the, you know, the key emotions, the key ingredients to, you know, of storytelling. So uh, it's true that, you know, I, th I think I started working on comedies around a time that people, uh, the audiences changed in their attitude. They wanted things a little more sophisticated. They didn't want to feel like they were being told what to feel. And so, uh, whereas before me, there were lots of people who you would would um, go straight to, you know, this is how we want the audience to respond. This is what, you know, this is funny, so make it funny music. The audiences don't want funny music. They want music that gives them license to explore what they feel. Now, sometimes, you know, it is that the music gives you license to find something funny, but it's not telling you that this is funny. It is simply saying, we're not taking this as seriously as we might. And then the audience just naturally finds the humor themselves. So, um, but yeah, I have a, you know, so within that, within that, yeah, I have a lot of experience in, um, in comedies, but they're, but they're, they're very, you know, they're very much, they're mostly quite sophisticated comedies. You know, I think I, my, my, the comedy, the comedy path opened up for me with Alexander Payne. But I'm not sure that you'd necessarily call him an, a, a comedy director. He's oh. he's a satire director, and uh, so I think really I, I came up. Obviously, things like uh, Legally Blonde are, are comedic, but, but but most of the stuff I've done has been, I think, um, more in the sort of satirical, um, self-conscious sense of uh, you know humor. One of my favorite directors of the younger generation is Jason Reitman, son of the legendary Ivan Reitman. And you scored many of his films, such as Thank You for Smoking, Labor Day, and also Up in the Air. Uh, his films tend to have a very strong narrative. What does he look for in terms of music? Do you usually talk in musical terms or is it all about emotion? Well, with Jason, Jason's different to most directors. Um... I'm just trying to think what, uh, how, what how that is. Um, it, it, I wouldn't say either. It's it's uh, we certainly don't talk in musical terms mostly, but we uh, it's what well, it's very much about. There's a, there's a lot of style involved in the discussion. Uh, so, for example, Labor Day, stylistically is is very different to anything else that I'd scored and anything else that J Jason had made. So uh, the discussion was very much about sort of just it being a very tonal score rather than a melodic score and uh, more about atmospheres and but but certainly about emotion. I mean, most discussions with directors are about story and what um, and emotion. Yeah. So story in terms of, you know, what uh, perspective are we taking? What's the point of view? that the we want the audience to be adopting at this particular point are we you know supporting are we empathetic to one particular character or do we have a very different point of view where we're we're watching what un, what unfolds from a distance and so those kind of questions generally come up in discussions about what the music is going to do you recently scored stan and ollie a biographical 
comedy drama dealing with Laurel and Hardy. Are they called Dick and Dorf in Germany? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dick and Dorf, yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, were the previous Lauren and Hardy films or Dick and Dove films a major inspiration for you and also a reason for you to score the film? Well, if you think about it, there actually is no music in those films. Yeah. Um, so, so no, <laughs> it was not in the music from, um, there was no music to be inspired by. I mean, it's just the opening title music, but sure. I don't think they use music in the actual films at all. So, um, no, I mean, yeah, obviously the, uh, that had no um, relevance to my process. Well, actually, I was more thinking in terms of the characters. As so many people grew up watching Laurel and Hardy, and I figured this might have been a major reason for you to say, I'm going to score this film. Well, actually, the opposite. The um, I, I certainly grew up seeing those films, but... Uh, I think my perspective now was kind of that you know, that I wasn't terribly <laughs> I wasn't terribly interested in um, Laurel and Hardy, but I was interested in the surprising story about how they spent so much time traveling around Britain. Which I knew one of them was English, but I, I would never I'd never connected the idea that these old Hollywood. Uh, movie stars would have spent so much time doing theatre shows in the UK. So that was interesting to me. And the, the main motivation, to be honest, was the, the director. I, uh, I think he's just a fascinating and very promising director. And he, he is so animated and has so many good stories and so interested in story that really I just wanted to do anything that John Baird was involved in. You wrote a catchy and also very heartfelt score for this film. Did you at first try to capture the comedic aspects of the movie or did you and, and the director focus on the characters? It's very much about um, character. So the opening theme is was written specifically to invoke a sense of period. The film, although most of the film happens in the 1950s, yes. The opening starts in the 1930s when they're at their peak of their success and we wanted the music to really embody the that kind of success and and embody something about the character of their you know of of the two of them so we had that lightness and skip and that bright energy because for at that particular moment in their careers everything was sunny and uh, bright so that's where the original concept for some of the music came from And that generated a theme which comes back time and time again through the film. And it also, that, that theme contains a little bit of that interplay between high woodwind and low woodwind, which is sort of the idea of Stan being, you know, being tall and skinny. So the high woodwind would represent him and the low wind wind would represent the, uh, the uh, rather plump uh, Laurel, uh, Hardy. Yeah, it was it was great to work on, partly because they really liked melody. And um, these days, there aren't many opportunities, or at least not many composers, writing much in the way of melodic music. So it's great to be great to be able to write something catchy. Were you actually allowed to work freely, or was music editing a major factor on this picture? Music editing is only supportive of the composer's music. I mean, that's my experience. Music editing is 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 not a is not really a thing that happens to the music. It is it is the guidance and help you know the, the way in which the film is the music is seated into the film. But the um, but there was a lot of uh, talking to the director and uh, backwards and back and forth, showing John music and then have him give make his comments. And uh, so there was, it was, we were always talking it over and discussing it. And, and uh, I was always getting direction from John to guide where he wanted the uh, music to go. Was there any scene in this film which you found particularly difficult to score? Maybe the montage at the end? Did this sequence pose a major challenge for you? Yeah, there was a couple of times. I mean, the, the, the end sequence... Uh, the day, so we recorded it in London, but I wrote it in Los Angeles, and so the 
I, I wanted to have it all finished in time to fly to London and record the score. And on the, I was flying on Saturday, and on the Friday morning, I showed the end title music, which has this, as you say, a montage of footage. Uh, I showed that to the director, and um, I, I was very pleased with it. It had all this energy. It was perfectly in sync with the dancing of Laurel and Hardy from the ancient, the old footage. And so it all lined up perfectly. And he heard it, and he just said, yeah, no, it's not there yet. Um, try something else. And I was going, oh, my God. I've got a day to go. This is three minutes of music, uh, full orchestral score, and he doesn't like the cue. And uh, I was <laughs> I was exasperated. I didn't know where to put myself. Fortunately, my music editor, Nick, uh, he had a word with me, and he said, what about taking... And he mentioned another piece of music from the film that I'd written for the film. And he said, why don't we just take a look and see how that looks? in this sequence. And we looked at it and I showed it to the director and he said, yeah, that, that looks promising. And so that day I wrote, you know, that last whole cue, music cue and sent it off and it all worked beautifully. Uh, it was a very different approach to the one I'd taken before, but it was right up to the wire because, you know, leaving the very next day uh, and needed to be ready. So that was uh, that was quite stressful, and there was, there was another montage in the film actually, where John John said uh, he wanted circus music, and I, you know when I think of circus music, I think of dun 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 dun, 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 dun <laughs> which which is, you know, it's a classic piece of circus music. I kind of don't like it at all, and it's 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 a, and it, and it actually wouldn't make any sense in this sequence. So I, I struggled a bit trying to wrestle with my ideas of what circus music means to me with this sequence in the film where nothing seemed to stick. So I ended up uh, doing something very rare for me. I ended up having to listen to a tiny bit of the temp music just to see what the hell he was talking about. And, uh, and I immediately got it. I just go, okay, that's not, stuck. <laughs> that's not circus music. That's something else altogether. But I, uh, but now I know what the vibe is he wanted, and uh, and then it happened very quickly. It was it was very uh, normally temp music uh, just confuses me yes. because it's 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 an idea and and I prefer to be struggling with my blank page and figuring finding an idea than than being told we've already we've already solved the problem but we want it better. And that's just, I don't know, that's just confusing to me. But uh, this is one instance where it was actually helpful. Temp music in general seems to be a double-edged sword. Some composers think of it as, as helpful. They think of it as a useful guideline. And others seem to struggle a lot, you know? Uh, I, I think you know, temp music is great uh, in that if they cut a film without using temp, they might cut it too tight there may be no room for any music because they didn't use any music so they weren't allowing for the possibility the emotional possibilities and the storytelling possibilities that music can bring but i don't want to hear it you know it's great that they use it so they they pace the film in a in a good way but uh but then it's but it's not helpful to me Rolf, when actors such as John C. Riley and Steve Coogan deliver those spot-on performances, do you feel this makes your job a bit easier to write for these characters? Yes, I, I'm always inspired by what's on the screen. The hardest thing to write for, I find, is animation, because the animation is generally not finished. So you're looking at really bad drawings and there's no inspiration to be found in really bad drawings. Whereas, uh, you know, if you have a superb performance to work with, then absolutely, it, it, it helps you up your game. It helps you, you know, excel because you've got something great to work with. And, and you can always, you know, whenever you try an idea out, it's quick, you know, it's very quick to see whether or not it's going to you know, stand up against a beautiful performance. So, as you say, Steve Coogan, who is just magnificent, and John C. Riley, who, you know, rightly got nominated nominations. You know, it, it, it 
baffled me because uh, I, when watching the film, you start thinking that this is exactly how Laurel and Hardy looked. And then when you look at actually their images, you just go, oh, no, they, <laughs> they, they don't look, they look quite a bit different. But the spirit of them is so, so completely captured by these performances that you just could get completely sold on the idea that this is Laurel and Hardy. And they, they really inhabit those characters so beautifully. And yeah, absolutely, it's an inspiration to me as a composer. Films of this kind are usually overlooked during the award season, not only in terms of the film itself, but also in terms of the score. What do you think is the reason behind that? Well, you know, awards aren't very... Uh, they don't really take to comedies very often. Yes. Um, I mean, it's, it's changing. It used to be... You know, it used to be that action films never got awards um, because there were there were more important films made for adults that were available. But there aren't any <laughs> anymore. So all sorts of action films and Marvel films get up for awards now, and um, so it's changing. Um, the uh, as regards comedy, you know, comedy scores never get almost never get awards, and. Um, And I think it's just, and to be honest, from my point of view, it's much easier to write music for a drama than a comedy. A comedy is, um, you have to have, pay so much attention to so many details because it's so easy to just kill the vibe, kill the atmosphere and the energy and the humor if you, put the, if you don't do the music perfectly. So um, it's one of those just ironies that... Uh, On the one hand, no one really thinks a, thinks a comedy is important enough to pay any attention to, but they're actually harder to make. Comedies get overlooked, that's a fact. And you're right, in terms of scoring a comedy, in terms of pacing, it's much harder to really underscore everything. And yeah, I mean, there's, there are pros and cons, of course, for, for any genre. And But what you, you, you definitely have a point. Well, certainly, when I, I was talking to a friend of mine who you know, just writes films for dramas, and and he said that once he's written five themes, he will just sort of look, put them every, put them in different places all over the film, and he and he's eighty percent finished. And I was going, Wait, what? <laughs> and then I realized that you can do that with a drama. You cannot, absolutely cannot, do that with a comedy because you always have to be. Uh, it always has to be bespoke tailoring it always has to be custom composed for that exact moment you don't have those big tranches of of you know emotional sweep that you can sl slap a theme over and uh, I, i and i love those films i mean i want i want to be doing dances with wolves that would be fantastic but dances with wolves you can just take a good theme and pour it over whereas in comedy you can never do that so um that just you know, i was amazed when my friend said that you know he said write five themes you uh, and then you just slap them all over the film and you're mostly done <laughs> it was going wow is that really even possible um so and maybe it isn't maybe he was exaggerating but still you know it was interesting to hear do you think that a film based on these characters featuring this kind of humor has a certain class and quality that most comedies lack these days? I don't, I don't know, actually. Um, you know, I, I, was, I, I was delighted with how well it turned out. I, yeah. I, you know, when I started on it, I thought, well, it's a biopic, but it's, it's going to be fun because it's going to be with John Baird. And um, it doesn't feel like a biopic at the end. It's, and it's not really, I don't even know that it meant to be a comedy particularly. Uh, it's set out to be, you know, about a, a kind of brotherhood between these two people and, um, and integrated some sort of fun from their film acts into, uh, their, into some of the action. And so, um, so I know it is funny. I've, se I've heard audiences laugh at it. But in terms of comparing it to, you know, what comedy is around at the moment, I think it always varies. I think there's always a variety of, of things from the very intelligent and sophisticated to the, the more broad and straightforward fun. I do think, you know, Hollywood does tend to sort of lean towards the broader end of comedy. 
but I love it. You know, but but even within some, you know, some of the uh, the action films now, there's more. There's a greater leaning on a sense of humor and a sort of meta sensibility. So you know, it it seems like some things are getting more intelligent. Maybe not everything, but uh, but some things are getting smarter. I mean, one of my you know feelings is that 30 years ago. Hollywood didn't have intelligent heroes. They were almost always blue collar. And um, because there's a Hollywood has, a, or, you know, the idea that America distrusts intellect with, with the exception of, of, um, of Indiana Jones, but, uh, but mostly it, it, it didn't exist. Whereas today we have lots of sophisticated heroes. Things keep changing. How much music did you record in London for Stan and Ollie? I think it was about 45 minutes. Are there any plans for a physical steel release? Uh, there, there is a soundtrack release, a physical release. Uh, I don't I don't know. I, I wouldn't really expect these days. You have to have a good reason to have a physical release. I, you know, I love vinyl. I have a few soundtracks out on uh, LP, but, uh, um, but I don't know. I, I, I would imagine it's, the plans are for a digital release. What's actually next for you? What are you currently working on? Can you disclose any of that? I'm working on a musical, uh, to be, uh, which is for stage, with the writer Joanne Harris. And uh, so that's probably a couple of years away. And um, I'm created a little uh, binaural ASMR performance piece, which uh, I'm performing in Paris in uh, a couple of weeks. And uh, I'm scoring a new film by the director of Spotlight, uh, Tom McCarthy. And that's the one I've just started on. Which director would you love to work with at some point in the future? That's, uh, there are too many. I mean, the, I think the, um, and I've been so fortunate in the directors I, I have got to work with. So, yeah, I think really, I, you know, I, I, I hope to work with Alexander Payne and Jim Taylor. Um, and with uh, Jason Reitman um, and keep on doing work, uh, projects with them because they're so inspiring and they're, they've got such a genuine talent in the way they conceive of filmmaking. The list goes on. I mean, there's actually many more, but uh, I, I'm, not really, I'm not really chasing down. Oh, actually, no, I'll, t I'll tell you one that I would love to work with, that I've, um, okay. which, which, which is um, Jean-Pierre Jeunet. Because I love his films, his sensibility and his eccentricities and the, and the beautiful visuals. I think I'd have a lot of fun working with him. Rolf, thank you so much for taking so much time out of your business schedule. I really love talking to you. Thank you very much.